I'm back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. We are talking this morning about the situation in Afghanistan. Our professor uh, with us is Thomas Schwartz at Vanderbilt. Always good to have him on. And lots of phone calls to the professor, folks who have uh, opinions and thoughts on uh, what we've seen happening in Afghanistan. Let's uh, take a, another call here. Uh, this one's coming from Tom. Tom, good morning. Hi, Tom. Hey, uh, yeah, I got a question. It's kind of like, uh, didn't uh, the Kur the Kurdistan? Did they not? Uh, they were kind of like against the diamond saying, weren't they? And uh, if uh, if that's the case, there was like three or four million of them up there in northern Iraq or something, wasn't there? And uh, do you think uh, could something like if they were or not? I mean, I don't really know. It's, I'm not uh, I'm that knowledgeable, but uh, I met somebody from there before over here, but. Uh, do you think something like, if that's true or not, do you think something like that could happen again uh, with a lot of Afghanis wanting to help uh, America, uh, uh, you know, defeat these other guys? And uh, what do they got? How many of them are there, you think? And where will they end up? Or uh, Okay. All right. Let's, I don't know. I, he may be going toward, and if you want to touch a bit on, you know, the Kurds and, and what happened in Iraq, but... Um, yeah, I guess he's wondering maybe, could there be factions now, pockets still in Afghanistan now, even though the, the forces have surrendered and the Taliban's kind of in charge, that will continue to kind of be revolutionaries fighting against whatever, you know, Taliban stronghold there is now? I, that is a possibility. Remember, there were, there was, there were factions against the Taliban back in the, the 90s. Uh, the Northern Alliance, the group that we allied with when we first went into Afghanistan, so that, it, remember, Afghanistan is a tribal culture. The, the Taliban are dominated by the Pashtuns, which is one of the largest groups there. And uh, what the caller is getting at is that we, we, of course, relied on the Kurds a lot in Iraq, who were very pro-American and pro, uh, and were willing to help us against Saddam. Uh, it is possible. I don't see the Biden administration actually doing much on this, because I think Biden really just wants out of Afghanistan. But it is possible that there may be within the debates within the administration the idea of providing support for guerrilla groups within afghanistan if they organize and are effective to uh, undermine the taliban government especially if the taliban uh, engage in the harsh repression that many are expecting them to do so that is a possibility i you know right now it's hard to see uh, we were never able to organize much of a resistance in south vietnam after that country fell um, so it's it's probably unlikely, but but not not out of the question at all. And hey, I was just thinking about this, a, just a tangible question about the weapons. You heard the president talking about how the Afghan force was trained by the U.S. military and provided <laughs> some of the state-of-the-art weaponry and the like. Now that they've collapsed, are those weapons in the hands of the Taliban? Of course. Okay. Yeah. No, that's uh, yeah, one of the yeah. well, that's one of the other terrible aspects of this. Yeah. Okay. I just that's the scary part of it, meaning that they can be using yeah. our own weapons against us if a conflict right. moves forward. But they now have all of those weapons, yeah. which is another thing that just gets me. I mean, how could this administration not at least say, "All right, let's consider the possibility that they're going to collapse." And you know what? They might. And what the heck's going to happen with all of our weapons when they do? I mean. <laughs> No. It's like, come on, yeah. this stuff's basic stuff. It can't, you know, I know you're sitting there saying, Nick, you don't understand behind the scenes how complex I'm sure it is. But come on. I mean, they knew that this trained military is probably not going to be up to snuff once we leave. And they've got all these weapons. They're going to roll over and play dead, and the weapons are going to end up in the hands of the Taliban. Now, I don't know exactly what you would do to prevent that if you're going to pull out anyway, but come on. I mean, it just seems, to me, it doesn't seem all that complex to at least consider that devastating option and do something about it. Well, this is, this is the issue that uh, the administration did not consider all the contingencies and all the possibilities after the withdrawal. This was why I think uh, many people are seeing this as an indictment of the administration's competence. It did not plan for this. Yeah, uh, well, my so. take is, I don't know that it's, con I, I think what it is, is judgment, because you'd have to be just flat out stupid not to consider that as a possibility. So don't tell me that they didn't know this was a possibility. They chose to ignore it. That's it. You're just an idiot if you don't. I mean, look, I'm sitting here figuring this out. You're telling me these intelligence experts in D.C. can't say, well, you know, let's just consider the possibility that the military we've trained doesn't win and they roll over. Uh, don't tell me they didn't well, consider they that answered. option. They knew that. That was a possibility. They would have answered you, Nick. They would have answered you, Nick, by saying, look, um, we, we, we are going to get out. If we were to take away the weapons in some way, we would be accused even more of undermining. So that their answer would have been that politically, if we're going to get out, we can't be accused of completely undermining 
uh, the army that we're leaving behind. So in that sense, just as in South Vietnam and other circumstances, you can't really say uh, what you really mean. Okay, and, and you make a good point there. And I, I wasn't suggesting there was an easy solution to accepting the fact that those weapons were going to end up in the hands of the uh, Taliban. That's just an unfortunate outcome here. I hate the thought of them having American weapons now that can be used against us. Let's go next to uh, Taylor. Taylor, good morning. Hi, Taylor. Good morning, Nick. Hey. And good morning to the professor. I appreciate uh, his perspective on this entire thing. I spoke a few years ago with a very smart combat vet that had served three tours in Afghanistan and he, he was uh, a platoon leader he wasn't a uh, pencil pusher over there and he indicated to me at that time that most of the heroic soldiers in Afghanistan were deceased. They they fought the fault, but that more recently, this three hundred thousand supposedly uh, army that they had was a payroll number, not a true reflection mm -hmm. of the fighting soldiers that they had left. He indicated on several battles, if they realized they mean the Afghans thought it was going to be a very serious battle half of them wouldn't even show up they depended totally on the Americans to do most of it now I think most Americans <coughs> did not mind our planning on leaving there but the way this has been handled it's been dumb and dumber. It was dumb of Trump to indicate the time that he was planning on pulling out. It was been dumber for the current president to, when he first said he was going to extend that three or four months, I thought, well, good, that'll give him more time to... Um, plan the right way to do it. Well, instead, they did absolutely nothing. We have left helicopters, hundreds of vehicles, warehouses full of ammunition, and not only a few rifles, but we've left the big guns. We have left a fortune in equipment over there that could have been slowly taken out of there and a much more orderly uh, leaving of that country. But yeah. the, 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 this entire <clears throat> Pentagon group, if they had laid out the best of plans to the president, he may have gotten, gone along with it. Hang tight, because we have to get up against a break, but I wanted to give the professor a chance to just comment on that. I, I'm just guessing that if any president, whichever of them, decided to do this, and we see Biden, it, I don't know that there was a clean, tidy way to do this. I think Taylor maybe makes some good points. You're right, you can't disarm the military, but couldn't they have started maybe? I mean, give me an example as we go to break. I'm sorry, I'm kind of just bouncing around here, but give me an example, professor, of how this could have been done more gracefully. Um, I think um, they should have waited until the winter. Uh, Afghanistan has a fighting season. Uh, deciding to pull out at the time of the fighting season when the Taliban were back in the country. Um, the Taliban usually retreated to Pakistan in the fall. And so a withdrawal that took a little bit longer and that took place without the sort of combat conditions uh, that the Taliban were imposing might have made a, a much more wiser a choice. Uh, there's all sorts of, of contingencies here. Uh, this was this was a politically driven decision that I think was simply uh, uh, overruled expert advice because of a fear that if we didn't get out now, we wouldn't get out. Okay, yeah, and, and you wonder, and the, obviously that'll be debated. I just think that no matter how you were going to do this, I mean, the decision to stay there for 20 years, 
it, you know, whenever you're going to pull out, it's going to be ugly. But there had to be a better way. Um, but I think no matter what, it was still going to be a mess. We're, we'll take a break. Come back with more calls. David, Ron, Sandra, and others uh, we will do that in our final segment with our fine guest right after this.